that's an improvement. <laughs> Take a moment and pray with me, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto you. Fill my lungs with your breath, my mouth with your message, so that all that I say, so that all that I do, bring honor and glory to you and to you alone. In the precious name of Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Today in, <clears throat> in the church is Transfiguration Sunday. Transfiguration means to change, change in looks or change in appearance. In today's <clears throat> scripture passage, we read how Jesus took three of his closest friends, Peter, James, and John, up to the top of a mountain with him. Now while they're up there, something amazing happens. Before their very eyes, Jesus is changed. He's changed from an ordinary looking man into someone with shining clothes, shining so bright, bright like an angel. It was as if a light had began to shine inside of Jesus. His face and his body, even his clothes, shone brightly. Then they saw Jesus standing next to Moses and Elijah, two incredibly famous um, leaders of the Jewish people, two people we learn about in our Old Testament readings. The disciples did not know what they were seeing. Was it their imagination? Was this really happening? Suddenly, the disciples began to see Jesus for who he really was. They were able to see both true man and true God. We know that Jesus joined the angels in heaven. And we know that Jesus was a teacher and a prophet like Moses and Elijah. But we also know that Jesus is way more than just a prophet. Jesus is way more than just an angel. Jesus is the Son of God. And this is why we should always see him for who he is and follow him. That day on the mountain, the disciples, <clears throat> excuse me, the disciples, they caught a glimpse of Jesus, showing them he was trying to teach them how he truly is God's son. You see, when we see someone clearly, we gain a better understanding of, of who they are. We may like a person even more, maybe even less, once we really get to know them. But you need to know who they really are. And you can't know that by just looking at someone. You have to get to know them. So here's a, a little how old are you question. Anybody remember the wide world of sports on television? All right, all right. So remember that as TVs were becoming staple in American households, yes, back in the 1950s, individual sporting events made for popular low-cost TV programs. But then in the dawn of the 1960s, Wide World of Sports, also known as ABC's Wide World of Sports, debuted. It was a new type of sports program. Rather than to focus on just one sport, it presented a variety of activity, of athletic events, all within a one hour or two hour show. But each week, I thought they did something really cool. Each week, as they transported us viewers around all of the United States and, and around the world, they featured so many athletes who otherwise we would have never known anything about them. There were bobsled racers and bodybuilders. There were gymnasts and figure skaters and ski jumpers, surfers and swimmers and divers and auto racers and stunt motorcyclists and rodeo performers and track and field. It was a whole variety of like every sport that you could learn something about. Anybody remember the show's Rally and Cry? The thrill of victory? Agony. And the agony of defeat. Anybody remember who the agony of defeat? Poor guy. He goes down in history because he messed up one time. He was a ski jumper from Slovenia. He was actually a house painter and a former ski jumper. So what happened was when he's getting to the bottom where he's supposed to jump, he kind of did the off the side and fell down. 
And they played that for years. His name was Binko Borgata. So all the while, the show spotlighted the human side of these sports. In addition to presenting races and bouts and meets and often by live satellite, Wide World of Sports revolutionized sports coverage by including what my favorite part was, the up-close and personal feature. On January uh, 3rd, 1998, sadly, it was announced that they were ending that show. But it was during those up-close and personal moments, the highlights, that they would pick an, a certain athlete, and they would go to that athlete's country and to their hometown, they would show you what their life as an athlete really was like, what their training schedule was, what their town looked like, what the landscape of their area was. They would introduce you to the athlete's family and the athlete's friends. And I don't know, for me, as just a mere baby in 1950, <coughs> Nicole, I heard you laugh a little too hard though. But I always thought it was very cool because I felt like I really got to know this athlete because I saw about his life. I learned about him or her. So when their event came on the show, that's who you cheered for because now I felt like I had a personal connection with that person. I knew where they lived. I knew all about their home, their routine. You have to get to know someone to really be in relationship with them. The Transfiguration experience was an occasion to strengthen the faith of the apostles so that in face of the uh, forthcoming trials of persecution, they would have something to hold on to, something to still assure them that Jesus is God. And that's why Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the top of Mount Mountain to show them who he really was. Not merely a great prophet, but the Son of God. The experience that they witnessed, that up close and personal moment, the experience that they were a part of, it stayed with them until eventually it was recorded in three out of the four Gospels. It remained with them. It shaped who they were. It became a part of them, a part of their testimony, a part of their witness as to who Jesus is. The Christ. But see, if we don't take that time to get to know Jesus up close and personal, how are we going to witness about him? Peter even describes this incident in his second letter, 2 Peter 1, 16 to 18. It says, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. As we come into this holy Lenten season, we would do very well to be attentive to this lesson, to this vision to this experience, to experience and acknowledge Jesus as God. The chosen one, the one who has commanded us in our reading today to listen to him. Jesus, the chosen one, the one who is able to carry us into the presence of God, the one who gives us peace, the one who gives us joy, the one who gives us victory over sin and death. Sometimes we tend to forget that. You see, we fall into our daily routines without much of a thought about the divinity that really does surround us, without any real awareness of the power that surrounds us and holds us up. We have business to do, we have people to see, and the hustle and bustle of our life. We get busy, busy in our work, and we lose track. We lose track of where we're going. We lose track of whose we are and of what has been promised <coughs> to us. How many of us here actually listen to God? What a change that may be for some of us if he really did stop and listen. How many of us here 
in our time of prayer, stop talking, stop reading, stop thinking about other concerns, and just listen. How many of us wait upon the Lord for his answer until he speaks, until he graces us with a dream or a vision, or a set of words, or an experience that he reveals to us? How many of us go apart for a while, as Jesus did with his disciples, and listen to the wind, maybe, and the rain? One of my favorite things when we're camping is I love at night if it rains, and in a camper, the sound of the rain hitting the roof, to me, it's just mesmerizing and so peaceful. But taking time just to be quiet and listen. Maybe gaze upon the moon and the stars. Maybe enter into silence just for a time. A silence where the words of Christ are not only remembered, but they become fresh and new and exciting. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to what he said to his disciples the night he was betrayed. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Listen, listen to those who face not only, whose face not only shown, but his entire being. For in listening, we ourselves can become transformed. We ourselves can become changed. And God's perfect light will cast out all of our darkness. Transformation, change. Is it easy or is it hard? Change is usually hard. Change usually takes work and persistence. That's a, there's a saying that the only one who likes a change is a baby with a wet diaper. <laughs> the European Journal of Psychology says, and an average of 66 days is needed to make a consistent change, to start a new habit. But then they also say it can take up to 254 days. 66 days to 254, that, that's quite a range. But just shows you it takes time. All of us at some point in our life have had to face change. And it is not easy. Some of the hard things may include quitting smoking, maintaining weight control, changing homes or jobs, or learning to live without a loved one. It takes work. And you know when we want to make a change and make ourselves better, it takes patience, and some more patience, and some more persistence. Not usually can you just change and you know, do the old wiggle your nose, if any of you remember Bewitched, but then you probably remember the 1950s too, so it's okay. If you're too young, you don't get it, but just know that it takes work to change. Speaking of working and working hard at something, yes, today is Super Bowl Sunday. Two teams and their season all comes down to tonight. So how many are picking the 49ers to win? Ooh, how many the Chiefs? How many don't care? <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> One of the things both teams have in common is that their coaches are constantly renewing, reviewing the basics of the sport with their teams. How many Sundays, if you're a football watcher, do we see players missing tackles, right? Basic football, how to tackle. How many times do we see a, um, somebody go to catch the ball and they start running before they actually secure the ball and catch it so they drop it? Basics in catching the ball. Good athletes can execute fundamentals consistently well. We believers must not neglect the basics of our faith, and we must continue to strive even harder to do the basics consistently. Basics such as being in a constant attitude of prayer, having an attitude of gratitude. <coughs> basics 
such as nothing is more important to you than the Lord your God. Not money, not your family. Loving God needs to be your top priority. Basics, such as Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters. Matthew 5, 34. Do not swear at all. That one could be a challenge for a lot of people tonight during the Super Bowl. Luke 12, 15. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Matthew 4, 4. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here are some more of Jesus' words. Worship the Lord your God only. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. My gosh, if I stood here and tried to tell you all the words of Jesus that were in the Bible, we would be here all day. Not that that would be a bad thing, but sometimes we're so busy with our own earthly agenda that the thought of being here all day and listening to someone speak Jesus' words would not be acceptable. A pastor friend of mine and I were talking the other day about the length, the length of the service. How long do you preach for? You know, they say the average person's attention span is only like seven minutes. So, it's questionable. But she says she can get going sometimes and she can preach for 45 minutes. Meaning her service may last two hours, two and a half hours. We don't do that. <laughs> but we are told to listen to Jesus. But do we listen? We have to make changes in our attitudes and in our lifestyles if we're going to change. If we're going to be transfigured into the human beings that Christ wants us to be, we need to put in the work. God put in the work by creating us. We need to uphold our end of the deal. And as Michelle said, we need to take care of this temple that God gifted us with. Basics. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest, and the second is like it. What is it? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's right. As Lent approaches this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday service here at Good Shepherd, 630. But I often hear this question. What are you giving up for Lent? Giving up means the same as fasting from. Many people choose something easy, maybe chocolate or soda or who knows. People choose a lot of different things. But as I thought about that this week, you know, I got a lot of nice feedback from uh, many of you appreciating that I talked last week about the United Methodist Church's understanding and practice of Holy Communion. So what does United Methodist Church say about fasting? Well, first, the Bible has a lot to say about fasting. Fasting is a sign of penitence practiced by individuals or whole people in the Old Testament. Jesus, as part of his spiritual preparation, went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He also commended fasting as an ongoing practice for his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. While fasting is associated with Lent, Methodists have never limited fasting to Lent. In our general rules of the United Methodist Church, and it is a big book, it commends fasting and abstinence as part of the ordinances of God upon which all Methodists are called to attain as they are able. Fasting usually means um, eating no food for a period of time. Abstinence means refraining from particular foods such as meat. So John Wesley, who's John Wesley? One of the founders. Founders of the Methodist religion, that's right. He fasted weekly from Thursday at sundown until receiving communion on Sunday, as the Church of England expected all of its clergy to do in the time. To Wesley, fasting or abstinence were ways to express sorrow for sin and penitence for overindulgence in his eating and drinking. He commended fasting to all Methodists to allow more time for prayer. And he noted that fasting or abstinence was more meaningful when you were, uh, if you combined it with giving to the poor. 
At the same time, he advised caution against extreme fasting, especially if your health was poor. The United Methodist Church does not have official guidance on how individuals should observe fasting or abstinence. Many choose to fast from food, but fasting or abstinence can also include restricting certain activities like watching television or shopping or social networking. Some choose to give away clothing or possessions, some time by volunteering, or increase the amount of time spent in prayer. Whenever or however we fast the United Methodist Church, we do so to reorient ourselves away from the compulsions and the distractions of our lives, to make more room in our life for the love of God, overflowing in love so that we can share that with our neighbor. We don't fast to bring attention to ourselves. We don't fast to show off and show what a good Christian I am because I, I fast during Lent. Again, we do it to reorient ourselves away from the compulsions and distractions of our lives to make more room for God, for his love, so that it overflows in us and out of us to others. <clears throat> Pope Francis had a great idea, and these are his words if you want to fast. He suggests that you fast from saying hurting words and instead say kind words. Fast from sadness and be filled with gratitude. Fast from anger and be filled with patience. Fast from pessimism and be filled with hope. Fast from worries and have trust in God. Fast from complaints and contemplate simplicity. Fast from pressures and be prayerful. Fast from bitterness and fill your hearts with joy. Fast from selfishness and be compassionate to each other. Fast from grudges and be reconciled. Fast from words and be silent so that you can listen. I thought they were great ideas. You see, for when we see Jesus more clearly, we then want to show other people how much we want to be like him to become Christ-like. Are you ready to start making a change? On this Transfiguration Sunday, I wonder how you can show others how much you're willing to change, how much you want to be like Jesus in everything you say and everything you do. So why is this Transfiguration Day important to us? The Transfiguration event was probably the most definitive revelation of Jesus as divine next to the resurrection itself. Here, Jesus is shown to be greater than the law. He is shown to be greater than the prophets and that he was the beginning of the new covenant, the new covenant of grace that brings humanity to salvation and brings glory to God. Amen? Amen. 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 Would you take a minute and pray, <clears throat> pray the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and then forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our next hymn is number 451 in your hymnal, Be Thou My Vision. If you're comfortable and able, please rise. The words will 